so thank you everyone for uh, for, for being here. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to introduce our speaker today. So the, the topic of today's webinar is AI for Sustainable Development. And this joint IADF and Re React webinar series uh, continues our series where we invite uh, government, industry, and academic experts in the specific domains of AI and EO for SDG and highlight what space agencies are already providing as products to support the development of tools and systems that are impacting um, so, um, societal, cha uh, societal challenges. So it's it's a, a great privilege to introduce our speaker today, Stefano Armon, who is an associate professor of computer science at Stanford. Uh, he's affiliated with uh, the AI lab and is a fellow of the Woods Institute for the Environment. His research is centered on techniques for probabilistic modeling of data and is motivated by applications in the emerging field of computational sustainability. Uh, he has won uh, numerous awards, including Best Paper Awards, NNSF Career Award, uh, ONR, AFOS, SR, uh, Young Investigator Awards, and so on. And so uh, without further ado, uh, Stefano, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for having me here. Let me see if I can share my screen. All right, can you see the slides? Uh, yes. All right, how long is the presentation? I have like 15, 45 minutes. So, yes, that should, that should be good. Perfect, all right, yeah. So yeah, thanks, thanks so much for inviting me. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll be telling you a little bit about some of the work I've been doing at Stanford with um, students and colleagues in other departments on trying to use AI techniques to accelerate sustainable development. Uh, the setting is one where we're seeing uh, uh, incredible capabilities emerging from uh, new methods being developed in, in AI. If you think about computer vision, there's been so much progress. We now have computers that are pretty good at understanding what's going on in images, videos. Uh, they can recognize objects, they can produce captions for us, they can even generate new images based on a caption. Uh, obviously, NLP has you know, made incredible progress. If you think about large language models, chatbots, you can ask questions to these systems and they will provide answers to you. Uh, you have conversations with, uh, with these AI agents. Uh, lots of progress in reinforcement learning, game playing, uh, applications in the sciences, uh, machine translation. Like it's been really lots of progress in developing um, amazing new capabilities in, in AI and ML. And I don't know if we're gonna get to AGI, artificial general intelligence, uh, anytime soon. But what's pretty clear to me is that there's gonna be a huge impact on uh, on the economy and pretty much every aspect of our lives and, and they're going to change the way we live, the way we work, the way we interact with each other, the way we interact with computers. And so, you know, in the last few years, I've really been thinking about what does this mean for uh, the big problems that we're facing as a, as a society today. So I've been thinking a lot about the, the, the SDGs, you see them here, uh, and in poverty, hunger, climate change, uh, renewable energy. And I'll be trying to think about how can we leverage these technologies, these new advances to uh, accelerate progress towards these, uh, these big problems, which I think are the ones that we really should be thinking about today. Uh, you, you know, we really wanna make sure that these technologies end up benefiting as many people as possible. They're not just gonna make a few select people very rich, uh, but uh, I've really been trying to think, I've been trying to Think about ways to to apply them to to make progress towards these these this really important problems that we're all we all should be thinking about today. And uh, so I've been talking a lot about uh, about these issues with experts on campus. And one of the kind of like common issues that I see across many of these domains is the lack of good data on the ground. Uh, perhaps this is best summarized by this quote from. From Kofi Annan, uh, from a recent, well, not so recent anymore, but not too long ago, a Nature paper on on food security. You know, and, and and quoting him, he said, "You know, data gaps undermine our ability to target resources, develop policies, track accountability. Without good data, we're flying blind. If you can see it, you can solve." It. Right, and he was referring to to food insecurity, but similar issues apply if you think about poverty, if you think about climate change, climate adaptation. 
um, lack of good data seems to be like a pretty common common issue. And uh, you know, we can try to be a little bit more quantitative here. Um, we actually went and tried to quantify really how much data is there uh, about these important uh, socioeconomic outcomes that we would like to be able to measure. If at the very least, we want to figure out whether we're making progress towards achieving these goals. So if you think about ending poverty, which is the goal number one on the SDG list, uh, the way we get data on poverty is through nationally representative surveys. And these are expensive to do. They're not, uh, you know, you have to send people on the ground, uh, interview people. And as a result, they are not done very frequently. And so we actually looked at, you know, essentially collected all the, the survey data available uh, in, in the world. And we tried to figure out okay, how much data is actually there uh, across different countries. And, and in some parts of the world, yeah, there is pretty good economic data. Uh, but the parts where we would need it the most, uh, you can see here, the countries are color coded by basically the, the intervals that occur between two consecutive surveys. Uh, the situation can be pretty bad right, in terms of like the number of years that pass between two measurements on these outcomes that we'd like to measure. And, you know, you can probably get a rough sense of the, the relationship just by looking at the geography and, and looking at which countries are red here. But, uh, you know, if you look at the more quantitatively about the relationship between the GDP per capita and the availability of data, you know, you see the relationship that you would expect. Uh, wealthier countries tend to have more economic data. You look at the relationship between uh, the availability of economic data and some kind of measurement of political freedom. Again, you see that the, the, the relationship you would expect where um, less um, societies that are less free uh, tend to have less data. Right? There's less incentive for these governments to uh, make the data available. And uh, it's a similar thing if you think about uh, you know, agricultural censuses or population censuses, even other kind of like key inputs when we think a lot of, uh, about a lot of these problems. Uh, the availability of data is actually pretty, uh, pretty bad. And so, you know, the, that's kind of like the, the <laughs> The, the way I think about this is that, you know, we have these big problems uh, with, uh, with little data. And uh, as a result, uh, what happens is that the programs that people implement are poorly targeted. We don't really understand the impact of the various interventions that, that uh, are being carried out around the world. Uh, products are not being developed, the money is wasted, opportunities are lost because we really don't understand what works and what doesn't. So uh, I've been thinking and working with colleagues on, on ways to provide uh, socioeconomic data on a global scale that are um, more, more scalable, more economic. And specifically, we've been thinking about ways to leverage uh, passively collected, cheap, uh, globally available data from satellites, from phones, uh, from uh, social media to and combine them with the advances in machine learning and AI to try to come up with better ways to measure how the world is changing over time and, and, uh, and infer these kind of like key socioeconomic outcomes that we'd like to be able to measure if we want to understand how they affect policy, how they affect decisions, how they affect targeting aid and these sort of issues. And so in particular, in this presentation, I'm going to focus on satellites. Uh, as you know, there's been a lot of progress in satellite technology over the last few few decades. Uh, you know, maybe uh, 10 years ago, you know, people were happy with the uh, Landsat quality images where the resolution is something like 30 meters by 30 meters per pixel, which are you know, great products, very useful for a lot of things. Uh, but the resolution maybe is just not good enough to see uh, more fine grain detail about human and, and, and economic activity on the ground. These days, it's pretty easy to get access to maybe medium resolution images. Let's say this one for from planet, uh, three meter resolution images where you can start to see a lot about what's going on on the ground at the same location. And, um, and we can start, you know, uh, thinking about, okay, what can we do using this kind of data uh, combine it with advances in computer vision and get automatic tools to understand how the environment is changing, how human activities are changing, where people live, what kind of economic activity activities they are conducting on the ground. And of course, you know, uh, there is higher resolution imagery, av imagery available where you can see a lot more, more fine grain detail. You know, you can see chicken yard here on the left where you can almost count the number of containers and, 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 and cars. Uh, you can see 
uh, a lot more detail about the kind of uh, uh, infrastructure that is available and the kind of uh, things that are happening on the ground. And so the the just again more quantitatively, just to to we try to to get a sense of you know how much better did uh, this is this the the availability has has the availability of satellite data become in the last in the last few years. And so this was kind of like the Pareto frontier of the uh, frequency versus resolution of the kind of data that was available in 2010 for a set of randomly chosen locations in Africa. And you know the meaning of this graph is that you know of course the higher the spatial resolution you want, uh, the less frequent you're going to be able to get an update uh, for that for that imagery. And so if you want uh, 50 centimeter digital globe images, roughly those are updated every year. If you're happy with the 500 meter MODIS kind of resolution, then you can get them maybe every every few days. Uh, this is what the frontier looked like in 2010. Uh, in 2019, uh, when we did this, uh, uh, when we published this paper, uh, the frontier was significantly shifted to the to the right, uh, meaning that uh, the, the quality and the frequency of the images that are available in across these random locations in Africa had significantly improved. Right, thanks to companies like Planet and and uh, Sentinel Two and uh, other uh, satellites that were that were developed over the decade, it really meant that the quality and the, and the quantity of, of data had increased dramatically. And uh, that was coupled with the advances that we've seen in, in, in deep learning and computer vision. So increased capabilities in terms of like developing models and algorithms that can actually make sense of these images at scale. And so, yeah, over the last uh, 10 years, we've been thinking a lot about, you know, is there a way to combine these two these two trends? Uh, can we take all these great satellite images that are becoming available? They are cheap. They are available everywhere, updated frequently. Combine them with the recent advances in deep learning and uh, come up with models that can automatically estimate these kind of socioeconomic outcomes that that we care about. Let's say build a model that can predict uh, village level poverty rates or, or understand the population health measures or can understand quality of infrastructure or all these kind of things that we would like to be able to measure on a global scale to, to really uh, be able to make more informed policy decisions uh, when we think about a lot of the, a lot of the SDGs. And uh, the, the challenge is that although, as we discussed, there's been a lot of progress in, uh, in developing uh, great uh, deep learning models and, and uh, you know if, if you have a lot of labeled data it's not too hard to train a deep neural network that will achieve pretty good accuracy on a variety of uh, computer vision tasks like recognizing objects or classifying images a lot of those advances relied on the availability of yeah, lots of labeled data you have to provide a lot of examples to your neural network of the kind of things you're looking for and uh, when we, we've been whenever we try to apply these techniques in the sustainability space, to these kind of like sustainability problems, we face the challenge that there is not a lot of training data available. That's precisely the reason we want to build these models, uh, because uh, you know the, the outcomes that we'd like to predict on the ground they are often not uh, measured very frequently, and so we kind of like have this technical challenge from a machine learning perspective of developing models that can achieve high accuracy uh, when we have access to a relatively small number of labels. Uh, of course, the good news is that there is a lot of unlabeled data. So uh, there is a lot of imagery that we can get access to. Uh, what's hard to get is really the, the corresponding labels, the corresponding uh, measurements on the ground. And, and it's not even a situation like where we can just hire some crowd workers to provide more labels for us. Sometimes it's just not possible to get, to get more labels because that would require uh, running a new survey and that's just not possible. So uh, a lot of the, the research on the technical side has focused on trying to leverage uh, unlabeled data to develop models that can get a broad understanding of what uh, remote sensing and satellite images uh, look like. And uh, that's kind of like the, the, the newest sort of like revolution that is happening in, uh, in, in AI and ML, this idea of training large foundation models 
using internet scale data without requiring a lot of supervision from humans and um, really just the uh, things like language models where you just collect massive amounts of text from the internet and you train a neural network to predict the next word or you train a neural network to uh, predict some missing words from your sentence or models like the masked out encoders that you see there on the on the right where again they are trained on internet scale quantities of images and they don't these models are trained without any labels they're basically just trained to reconstruct the inputs like you start with an image you mask out some of the patches and then you train a model to reconstruct them and uh, in order to perform well in this task essentially the model has to understand the structure of these images and uh, in doing so it learns representations that then can be transferred on a variety of gaussian tasks and that's kind of like has been the paradigm uh, behind uh, large language models uh, the chat gpt is and, and those sort of models are all based on this on this kind of idea of not using so much uh, uh, human supervision but really leveraging large amounts of unlabeled data and uh, uh, use these kind of like self-supervised learning objectives to to learn good representations that can be transferred to a variety of national tasks and so that's uh, something we've also been exploring uh, at Stanford in the context of uh, remote sensing and geospatial data. Uh, one uh, source of data that we found to be pretty pretty useful for, uh, uh, for training these kind of uh, models is uh, Wikipedia. Um, there is a lot of Wikipedia articles that are actually uh, geolocated, meaning that they have a corresponding uh, latitude and longitude for where the the location or the object described in the article is. And so we've been thinking about, you know, is there a way to leverage this kind of like uh, large scale crowdsourced data sets like Wikipedia to train a model to learn something about uh, what's happening around the, around the world. And uh, our idea, uh, you know, and, and, and here you can get a sense of the, of the article distribution. Uh, so these are all, each dot here corresponds to a, a Wikipedia article that is geolocated. And uh, you can see that there is, a, there is really a lot of them. They're pretty well, uh, that, you know, they're, they're all over the world. And yeah, it's pretty cool that if you just plot the, here, the, the, the shape of the continents is not actually overlaid on the image. It just appears naturally just because people tend to write articles about uh, locations close to where people live. And then it's like you kind of like get the shape of the continents automatically just by plotting the location of Wikipedia articles. No, the, the idea is that the, the Wikipedia article contains a lot of information about the, the location described in the, in the article. And uh, we can think of it as a very detailed caption of the, uh, corresponding, of the corresponding location. And so what we can do is we can, start, we can, try, we can start to construct these uh, large multimodal data sets where we look at Wikipedia articles uh, that are geolocated for each location, we can acquire the corresponding uh, satellite image. And then uh, you can think of the Wikipedia article again, sort of like as a caption of a lot of the information uh, of, of what's happening in the, in, the, in the corresponding satellite image. And again, we can construct this without actually requiring any human intervention. We're just pairing these two, these two modalities in a, in a clever way. Then what we can do is we can train, we can use some of these advanced NLP models to essentially extract some kind of like vector representation of the, of the text containing the Wikipedia article. You can think of it as a vector that summarizes the information contained in the, in the Wikipedia article. And we can train a, a convolutional neural network, some kind of like vision, computer vision model to map the satellite image to a vector representation that is similar to the one captured by the by the Wikipedia article. And again, this doesn't require any human supervision. We can just leverage the, a lot of Wikipedia articles and the corresponding satellite images to do this. And in doing so, we are basically forcing the computer vision model to um, uh, predict properties, basically, of the Wikipedia article from the satellite image. And uh, by doing so, we end up learning representations that are actually uh, quite good, and it turns out that this visual, uh, this this visual embedding model can then be uh, fine-tuned on tasks like uh, functional map of the world, 
to recognize different kinds of objects and it leads to big improvements in accuracy in terms of the, uh, the ability of these models to recognize different types of infrastructure. Uh, another kind of like a key uh, uh, idea behind these advances in self-supervised learning is contrastive methods. Uh, so here, the idea is that if you don't have the corresponding caption, you don't have the corresponding text, one thing you can do is you can leverage unlabeled images to um, train a model to find good representations for these images. And uh, the key idea behind these contrastive self-supervised learning methods is that uh, we would like to, they, they essentially construct a data set uh, where we want to construct pairs of images that let's say come from the same image. And uh, the idea is that a neural network is trained to make sure that pairs of, of, of patches that come from the same image end up being closer than uh, patches that come from di different images, negative pairs that come from different images. The idea being that if two patches come from the same image, they're more likely to be similar, they're more likely to capture similar concepts. And so uh, in doing so, they're kind of like forcing the model to learn representations that have some kind of meaning, and then it can be transferred to a variety of downstream tasks. And these models tend to work really well in, in traditional computer vision. Uh, they've had a lot of success and they're really closing the gap between uh, uh, fully supervised models and self-supervised learning models. And so we've been thinking about ways to extend these kind of ideas to, to remote sensing data, uh, which are a little bit different compared to traditional computer vision uh, data sets. Of course, uh, you know, we uh, often have access to uh, sequences of images over time. Uh, so we have access to the, the location over at which the image was taken. We have access about the, we have access to the timestamp at, at which the, the, the location was taken. And uh, you know we often have access to multiple uh, bands. Uh, we don't just act, we don't just have RGB images, but you know we might have access to infrared or um, or radar or other kind of uh, bands that capture additional information beyond the, the the visible light. And so we've been thinking a lot about ways to adapt existing state of the art self supervised learning models to remote sensing data. Uh, our first uh, experiment was basically trying to extend uh, uh, contrastive self-supervised learning models to uh, geospatial data and satellite images in particular. Here you kind of like see a high level uh, picture of how contrastive learning methods work on, uh, on traditional images. Uh, the idea is that you start with, uh, you construct pairs of images from, from your data set. You see here an image of a dog and an image of a chair. Uh, then you construct pairs, you, you extract two uh, pairs of patches from each image, and uh, you apply augmentations to these patches um, as it, by changing the colors or flipping them or applying sm small perturbations to these, to these patches. And then you train your, your self-supervised learning model to map these uh, four patches to vector representations. And the, the learning objective is not entirely self-supervised, so there is no supervision coming from humans. The learning objective is gonna try to make the vectors corresponding to patches coming from the same image closer than the vector representation corresponding to patches coming from different images. So you can see here, the green arrow is kind of like saying, we're trying to make those uh, patches close to each other versus the red arrow is kind of like indicating that we're trying to make those uh, vector representations far away. And uh, by doing so, these models end up uh, uh, learning representations that work extremely well. Let's say on ImageNet, they can achieve very high accuracy and they significantly reduce the, the amount of training data that is necessary to, to achieve good performance on those, on those data sets. And uh, we've extended these kind of ideas to, to um, your spatial data. Um, We've been able to incorporate additional bands. Uh, we've also been able to take advantage of the fact that yeah, we have access to multiple images over time for the same location. And so instead of relying on this kind of like handcrafted data augmentation techniques, like applying a slight color changes or jittering the images, uh, we've, uh, uh, we can kind of like think of mm, different images taking over time for the same location as uh, multiple views of the same of the same patch. 
And again, we can basically train a model to map these different representations of the same location that were collected over different over different time steps to uh, representations that should be similar in this uh, in this semantic feature space. And uh, we can do this. We can take advantage of the fact that we know where the images have, are located over time, so we can actually embed that information into the neural network. And again, this leads to 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 big improvements in terms of the, the performance that we get in downstream tasks. Uh, perhaps our, our latest, uh, this is a recent Anuris paper, which I think is, is really the, the state of the art in terms of uh, self-supervised learning applied to satellite images, is the is based on the mask out encoder kind of architecture, uh, where the, the idea is that uh, you start with unlabeled data, you, uh, which you can think of as an image, you uh, train a model to, you, you mask parts of each image in your training set, and then you train a encoder decoder model to reconstruct the, the, the values of the patches that have been masked out by this, uh, by this process. So this is very similar to what's been done in language modeling where uh, masked language modeling, where you, you train a neural network to predict missing words in a sentence where you've removed the, the words yourself. And by doing so, you're kind of like learn, forcing the model to understand the meaning of the images and or the meaning of the text. And this kind of architecture has shown to be very effective also on, on computer vision tasks. So we've extended this sort of architecture to deal with uh, remote sensing data, where again, we have uh, multiple images taking over time and we have access to uh, multiple bands. So again, we can apply a very similar kind of idea where we take the various views that we get of a location over, over time and over different uh, uh, bandwidths and we apply a transformer model to basically, well, first we, 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 we patchify it just because that's the only thing that a transformer model can, can have access to. And then we have a transformer, a vision transformer kind of architecture that encodes all these patches information into a latent representation. And then there is a decoder model that learns to um, essentially uh, reconstruct the, the the values that we've been we've been masking out from the from the input of the of the decoder, and of course there is many different ways to to apply the the patching and the masking. You know you could imagine masking uh, over space. Uh, you could imagine masking over time. You could imagine masking over different bands. We've explored a variety of different techniques of applying uh, this, this masking and different ways of encoding the spatial temporal information into, into the transformer model. But the end result is a model that works extremely well um, on a functional map of the world. Again, the, the data set that we've seen before, which is a large scale data set of, of, uh, uh, of satellite images. And it's a classification problem where the, the goal is to classify uh, images into uh, a variety of different classes related to infrastructure. Uh, this kind of model achieves uh, very high performance. It beats the geography aware of supervised learning. It beats models trained on ImageNet. And uh, I believe this is a state of the art in terms of the, the accuracy that you can get on functional map of the world. And the beauty of this is that, yeah, it's, once you pre-train the model on a lot of unlabeled data based on this uh, masked uh, autoencoding kind of framework, you get a representation and then transfers very well on a variety of different tasks. You can use it for land cover classification. You can use it for building segmentation. You can use it on uh, a variety of uh, uh, classification and segmentation data sets, and uh, it works pretty well. So it, it, it uh, achieves high accuracy, good performance, uh, requiring a relatively small number of labels because it has been trained on a lot of unlabeled data to, to, to acquire good representations. And uh, what this means is that we can start to apply these kind of models to uh, understand uh, back to the original problem of trying to track socioeconomic indicators around the world. Um, we can start to leverage these uh, pre-trained representations and these pre-trained models and these sub-supervised learning models that are pretty good at acquiring at extracting features from, from satellite images. And we can start using them to come up with models that can accurately predict uh, economic development, uh, population health measures, infrastructure quality access measures, and things like that. And the basic idea is that, again, we do have access to a small number of locations for which we have survey data available. And what we can do is we can acquire the corresponding satellite images 
Um, and uh, you can take advantage of these uh, models that are being pre-trained and they're pretty good at mapping satellite images to representations that are uh, semantically meaningful and they have been trained in an unsupervised way or sub-supervised way or uh, potentially on different data sets. So they leverage a lot of unlabeled data and they become pretty good at understanding the content and the meaning of satellite images. And uh, once we have these rich visual features uh, through a SAT MAE or maybe through, uh, oh, what's happening here? Somebody's writing on the screen, but yeah. Uh, once we get the, the rich visual features, uh, what we can do is we can uh, fine tune the model or we can just extract the features and train some kind of like a regression model to predict uh, the, the variables of interest from this, these rich visual features. And uh, once we have the model, then of course we can use it at test time and we can fill in the data gaps. We can look at new locations for which we don't have access to, to, to any labeled data because you know, maybe these villages were not surveyed in the, in the original data collection process. We can acquire the corresponding images, we can fit them through the model, and we can come up with predictive values for, for these locations. And uh, this uh, ends up working quite well across a variety of different indicators of interest. Here is an example of how the model works in terms of predicting poverty. So we did a large scale study where we took basically all the, uh, we, collect, we put together all the uh, survey data that was collected in, uh, in Africa over, over a decade. And uh, we, for every village, or for that was surveyed in, in, in one of these on one of these uh, uh, surveys, we extract some uh, indicator that is basically uh, measuring uh, asset wealth. It's, it's kind of like a PCA kind of index that is measuring what kind of assets assets people have access to in the, in the village. And uh, what we evaluate is basically how well does a machine learning model that is trained to predict this kind of uh, asset wealth indicators from uh, satellite images do in, in terms of uh, in terms of R square. And so what you can see here on the on the on the left panel is basically um, a scatter plot showing the predicted asset wealth index versus the true measured asset L wealth index from the survey uh, at the village level and at the district level. Uh, across uh, thousands of different villages or, or, or districts in, in, in Africa. And uh, what you can see is that the, the deep learning model does surprisingly well at predicting uh, asset wealth. Uh, you know, it gets an R square of almost 0.7 at the village level, even higher if you're willing to get a little bit more coarse predictions at the, at the district level. So it, it's, it's now it's capturing 70% of the variation that exists on the ground. And we can do it entirely, entirely from space just by leveraging advances in, in deep learning and, uh, and, and satellite images. Now you ask uh, how good are these, uh, are these uh, R square values? Are we actually doing a, a good job or not here? And we think they are actually quite good. Um, one way we, we, uh, we evaluate this is we uh, actually for some, of this uh, of this service, we have access to two independent kind of like measurements, um, maybe one from a census, one from a survey, or uh, that are supposed to be measured the same things. And we can see to what extent these uh, surveys and census uh, actually correlate with each other. And uh, because even the, the, the ground truth is actually measured with a certain level of uh, you know, there is measurement errors in the way we measure these, uh, these indicators on the ground. Uh, two independent surveys that are supposed to measure the same thing will actually not match perfectly. And the R squares between these two independent measurements uh, is actually, again, 0 0.8, pounds, 89, depending on how you measure these things and whether you weighted or not. But it's in the right, in the same ballpark of the kind of like correlation that you see uh, between satellite-based predictions and uh, census-based predictions. So we think that we can do almost as well as what you can do by actually sending people on the ground, uh, but we can do it in a much more scalable way 
And uh, we can basically, once we've trained these models, what we can do is we can, we can run them and we can make predictions essentially everywhere, say in Africa, uh, this is kind of like what their, their estimates look like. Um, this is at the state level, where in, uh, in over a period of uh, 20 years, we can kind of like get a sense of which states are doing better compared, you know, relatively to each other in terms of in terms of asset wealth. Here, red indicates wealthier locations, and blue indicates uh, poorer locations. And uh, you know, we can zoom in. You know, you can say, okay, I care about. Uh, let's look at Kenya. How well are different districts within Kenya doing? I mean, this is in 2003. You can look at 2007. You look, you know, across. You can check how the situation is changing over time, of course. And uh, but the good thing is that you know these predictions are extremely scalable, and and you can go down at the level of individual villages, and you can get a sense of you know how well are individual villages doing. Uh, in, in terms of asset wealth, we can also predict uh, consumption, like how, how much many dollars per day people have access to and, and, and can spend. And yeah, the accuracy there is a little bit lower, but again, uh, these models perform quite well. And the, the, the beauty of this is that they, they are scalable. We can run them over large geographies. We can come up with predictions that are pretty accurate and we can keep them up to date because you know, as soon as new images are available, we can fit them through the models and we can come up with uh, more accurate estimates of these, of these indicators. And uh, you know, this is already having a, a, a pretty, pretty uh, big world, you know, real world impact. Uh, this is a, yeah, an article from Wired a couple of years ago discussing how these sort of estimates are being used by governments in, in, uh, around the world to target aid um, related to COVID, for example. I'll talk a little bit more later about other sort of like real world impact of these technologies are having. But these sort of like hyper-local accurate indicators of economic development are super useful. They're useful to understand progress. They are useful to understand policies. They're useful in the social sciences to understand uh, the economic, uh, the, the drivers of the kind of a variation that exists on the ground. They're useful to NGOs and, and, and aid agencies to target aid in a more efficient way. Uh, there's a lot of use cases that this kind of like highly accurate, highly local, frequently updated economic data can provide to a, a variety of different users. Um, one of the challenges, maybe, let me see how much time do I have. Maybe I'll skip this, but uh, of course, one of the challenges is scalability. You know, we need to run these models over extremely large geographies, uh, which means that we might need to process huge amounts of especially high resolution satellite images if you want to get the, the highest possible accuracy. So we've been exploring uh, applications of uh, reinforcement learning to basically train models to uh, figure out essentially uh, from uh, low resolution or medium resolution images uh, which locations are really important to look at uh, at higher resolution before making a prediction. If you look at images like this, uh, you probably know that, yeah, we don't need to go and zoom in and see what happens in the in the water there, but we might want to zoom in into this location because there are buildings there and maybe having access to a high resolution image there could improve our, our estimates. And so we've basically trained uh, uh, an agent, an reinforcement learning agent, to essentially figure out when and where to zoom. And then the kind of a key trade-off here is that you want to maximize the quality of the final predictions that you, produ that you produce while minimizing the cost of basically acquiring high resolution images and, uh, and potentially also the compute cost. Because of course, it's more expensive to process high resolution images than low resolution images. And uh, this reinforcement learning agent is basically uh, learning how to, when and where to basically acquire high resolution images. And uh, uh, it does so by basically, yeah, uh, using reinforcement learning techniques. And uh, yeah, it, it, it works quite well. And so it kind of like learns, it looks at the low resolution images, it figures out which locations to zoom in, and then maybe it runs object detection to, to figure out, okay, what kind of objects do we see there? And uh, this gives you, very small drops in accuracy, but it significantly reduces the number of high resolution images needed, maybe a factor of 10. So there's lots of interesting ideas here in terms of like making these pipelines more scalable by doing adaptive data acquisition where the, the computer model is actually deciding what kind of data sets it needs to acquire in order to come up with 
the best possible accuracy at a given uh, with a given budget constraint. Uh, we've applied these kind of uh, ideas beyond uh, poverty and, and economic development measures. Uh, we've shown that you can use uh, remote sensing data to uh, predict uh, crop yields pretty accurately. Uh, we did it uh, back in 2017 and uh, in the US, uh, and we were able to get pretty good predictions, um, even slightly more accurate than the, the ones provided by the US De the Department of Agriculture, at least for earlier in the, in the, in the season. Um, and you know, the cool thing is that, again, we can apply these models. They're not super interesting in the US, uh, but they're extremely helpful if you start applying these models in geographies where uh, this kind of data on agricultural systems is, is severely lacking. We can apply these models in, uh, let's say, Kenya, and you can look at uh, maize yields uh, at the state level, and you can see, okay, which uh, states are performing better compared to each other. You can zoom in at the level of individual districts, and you can see which ones are more productive, which ones are less productive. And the cool thing is, again, the resolution can be extremely high. You can zoom down at the level of individual smallholder farmer uh, fields, and you can see, okay, which fields are, are, are productive, which ones are not, how is the situation changing on the ground, what drives the variation, how is climate, uh, and, and then maybe uh, drought years, how are they affecting yields across different regions, uh, which agricultural practices are working and which ones aren't. So lots of interesting insights can be obtained once you have access to this, uh, to, to, to crop yields and you can tie it to, to other economic measures of poverty and, and, and um, asset wealth and consumption. You can see how these things are related. Lots of interesting analysis that are possible once you start understanding all the different aspects of the, of the local economy. Infrastructure quality access is another thing we've been looking at, and we can do pretty well at predicting uh, whether or not people have access to electricity, how reliable it is. Um, we've looked at a uh, uh, number of things that can be predicted from space. Uh, we have another uh, recent paper kind of uh, tracking uh, mapping brick kilns um, across Bangladesh. Maybe let me skip this, but sort of like the, the, the key idea is that yeah, there is a lot of uh, things that we can now predict pretty well from space using high resolution satellite images and, and, and advances in deep learning, population density, refugee camps, uh, agricultural related things like where, what kind of crops people are growing, how well they're doing uh, over time and space, uh, access to infrastructure, or economic measures of uh, wealth or, or, or consumption, lots of different things that now we can measure pretty accurately uh, from space and across wide geographies. And, uh, you know, it's not just satellite images. I mentioned at the beginning that, uh, you know, uh, we've been exploring different sources of data that are widely available and uh, relatively inexpensive to acquire. Turns out that there is also a lot of street level imagery that is uh, becoming available across the world. Uh, this is uh, the kind of like availability of data from Mapillary, um, which is like a crowdsourcing platform. Uh, uh, Wire um, images, street level images from uh, from uh, from users, and we're driving around with dashboard cams essentially. And uh, so you can think of this as a Google Street View alternative that is crowdsourced. And is uh, unlike Street View is actually available across across the world, as you can see on the in this map on the right. Uh, unlike Street View, the quality of the images is typically uh, quite a bit worse. Uh, you can see cracks in the windshields and, and kind of like uh, crazy stuff. But the good news is that there is a lot of images uh, and and uh, they are uh, quite available across across the world. And so there is uh, an interesting possibility in terms of like combining. What we can see from space with what we can see uh, on the ground, which definitely things that we wouldn't be able to uh, to see from from space, uh, but are now possible if you have street level imagery. You can see storefronts, you can see people, you can see different vehicles, uh, you can see you know infrastructure elements that are too small to see to see from space, and uh, we've been exploring this kind of idea of combining satellite images and street level images to come up with better indicators of socioeconomic in, uh, indicators, population density, even population health measures like BMIs, 
And uh, it turns out you can do pretty well uh, just by uh, taking all these images, feeding them through uh, suitable deep learning models that extracts features with the kind of things you can see in the in the images. And um, yeah, you can do again pretty well in terms of like predicting uh, wealth or poverty, population density, and, and population health measures. So it's all uh, um, pretty exciting in terms of the, the, the kind of capabilities which we're starting to look into phone data, um, and uh, yeah, there is there is quite a lot I think that can be done in this space of combining uh, different kind of uh, input data from space, from the ground, on the phones to really come up with the best possible estimate of of how the situation is changing on the ground. Uh, we've actually put together a, a benchmark uh, for uh, the application of machine learning to these kind of different. Uh, types of data to predict different kinds of outputs that are related to the sustainable development goals. Uh, we had a recent uh, NeurIPS paper in, uh, for the data set and benchmark track of NeurIPS, uh, sort of like uh, trying to put together all these different uh, uh, tasks and data sets that we have been collecting over the years related to poverty, population health, education quality, uh, crop yields, and uh, we try to make it available to, to people in the machine learning community so that you know, a lot of people in ML tend to work on the usual data sets just because they're easy to access. And, and uh, you know, what we were thinking is that if people start pushing harder on, this, on these benchmarks and uh, really pushing the envelope in terms of the accuracy of the predictions that we can get on this task, then that's kind of like a win-win situation because on the one hand, we are improving the state of the art in machine learning. We're developing new models. On the other hand, accuracy improvements on these kind of tasks uh, might have real world consequences in terms of the, 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 the way people use the predictions to inform policies and, and uh, target aid and, and other operations on the ground. And so if you're interested, yeah, you know, please take a look at the sustain bench. Uh, data set, uh, there's a variety of different tasks. We're trying to keep track how well we can uh, we can do in, in terms of the uh, the accuracy that we can get with different machine learning models. And we're hoping to to develop a community of people in, in ML and, and uh, to that are interested in sort of like applying ML, the advance in the state of the art in terms of using ML to 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 address the sustainable development. And uh, yeah, the final thing I will mention again, back to the, to the impact side of things, uh, we've actually also been commercializing some of the technologies that we've been developing at Stanford. Uh, we uh, launched a startup a few years ago called Atlas AI, kind of like trying to, uh, to really uh, exploit this, uh, these two, Big trends that we were seeing at the time: the exponential rates of uh, new data being captured from from space, and not only space, but also phones and, and other devices, and uh, the availability of machine learning models to uh, predict these changes and in, in economic data and use it to guide economic decisions on the ground. And uh, yeah, so that's sort of like the, the, the key mission of Atlas AI is to like build a digital twin of the world's economy that we can use to understand how the situation is changing on the ground, target aid, uh, target the uh, infrastructure investment decisions, uh, interpret what's happening on the ground, ask causal inference questions about how different interventions are affecting the situation on the ground, which people have been showing that it's possible, it's actually possible to use satellite-based estimates to understand the effect of cash transfers to the uh, in, in, uh, in developing countries, forecast uh, you know, how climate change will affect different, uh, different socioeconomic indicators, uh, evaluate, uh, you know, the, of course, that, that's, a, that's a big issue that in, 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 uh, in, in this space is really understanding the, the actual effect of different interventions that people are implementing on the ground. So it turns out that it can make evaluation much cheaper if you have access to 
estimates from space that you can update very frequently. Uh, you know, you, you can you can monitor if people are actually doing what they are supposed to be doing. You can measure how well things are changing because of the interventions that people are implementing. And we can use this data fabric, all these different indicators that we can estimate from space, to really get a comprehensive view of the of the uh, of the situation on the ground, which can inform a variety of different of different use cases. And here are just some of them. You know, give directly is using this kind of data to uh, target the cash transfers to the poorest people, and and now they're expanding these over the entire country of Africa. Uh, telecommunication companies are using this kind of uh, data to figure out where to build new fiber infrastructure and communication infrastructure. NGOs are using this to target uh, vitamin supplements and, and, and find the most vulnerable populations on the ground. And, and there's a whole lot of different use cases of uh, different sort of like um, uh, di different users that you know really need to understand the economic data on the ground to make informed decisions or, or do evaluation to figure out how different interventions are working. And uh, we are, you know, uncovering blind spots, and you know, we're revealing emerging opportunities, missed opportunities, and uh, it's been really successful in terms of uh, enabling a whole lot of use cases, a lot of um, applications that were not possible before, because as we discussed, uh, it's, the data was just not there. The risks were too high, and people were not able to 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 implement the policies that they want. So yeah, I think that's. Uh, I think I'm. I'm, I'm running out of time. So that's probably the, the give you a sense of the kind of things we've been doing at Stem4 in terms of uh, uh, trying to use AI. I'm personally an AI researcher. You know, that, that's what I work on. That's what I know, developing AI and ML models. And, uh, but really trying to, to address, to, to, to steer them in a, in a direction that is really trying to address these big, uh, um, the big vital problems that I think we're facing um, today. The, the, the SDGs and in poverty, hunger, climate change. And uh, yeah, we've really been thinking about ways to, to push the envelope, bring in more data-driven insights into, into the way people make decisions, bring in more quantitative tools, more predict, better predictive tools. And there's a big space here in terms of like the kind of things these new technologies can do. We're really just scratching the, the surface. Especially, we've been focusing on yeah, filling the data gaps and and and, and uh, building predictive models. But there is a whole lot of optimization that could be built on top. I think once we have better data on what's happening on the ground, so lots of opportunities for bringing in other sort of uh, AI advances and and really uh, make progress towards these uh, towards these big, these big challenges that we're facing today. And uh, yeah, I think that's that's about it. Uh, I'm happy to take questions if there is time. All right. Thank you so much, Stefano. That was that's a lot of exciting work. Um, and so I'll open the floor for questions. And um, anybody from the audience, um, feel free to ask questions. Unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, my name is uh, Lurokbo. Hi, Adele. Uh, for, uh, calling from Texas. I just want to ask some questions. I think uh, these are very good uh, you know, information. Uh, in the earlier presentation, the issue about a uh, wet asset wealth index predictions, uh, <clears throat> in terms of the inputs that goes into that model, uh, can you you know uh, talk more about this? The reason I'm saying this is because you know we all know the issue about biases in predictions. Uh, the type of information that is provided uh, might skew what you know what we, what we think is the asset wealth you know index indicator. So if we can shed more light on this. I think that would be very good. And also, <clears throat> that's the first question re uh, regarding this. The second question is about the correlation. Those correlations, I think they were between 0.5 to 0.8. I was thinking maybe you can have something close to 0.9 or even bigger than that. Okay. Then the third question has to do with the uh, this model for this, again, for the wealth asset wealth index indicator. Can this be generalized to other part of the world? So that at least we have some, okay, if we can use this in this part of part of the region of the world, can we use this in other region and the other part of the world? You know, so those are the three questions around the asset wealth index. All right. Yeah, thanks. These are great questions. So let me start by the easier one. Uh, so yeah, does it work in other parts of the world? Yes. So we've uh, we've applied it to in India, Southeast Asia, 
uh, other groups have replicated this in uh, in uh, Central America. So yes, the the, the technology generalizes well, and, and it has been shown to yeah, work across a variety of different geographies. So uh, yes, the other question was what kind of uh, you know can we get higher R squares? Uh, hopefully so. Um, I think it's going to be hard, partially because the as we sort of like discussed the the labels themselves are noisy. I mean, they come from survey data. And so even if you look at two surveys that are supposed to measure the same thing, they, are, they don't match up with each other. So there's just noise in the measurements. And so that's going to be sort of like, it's going to be very hard to do, to do, to, to improve over that. And given that the, the ground truth, the, the gold standard is noisy, there's not even going to be able, we're not even going to be able to, to measure whether we are getting higher R squares or, or, or not for sure. So I think that's going to be a little bit hard. The first question, yeah, perhaps is the hardest, is uh, you know biases and and um, why do this model, what kind of features are these models using to to make the predictions? And that's a question we get a lot, and it's a very good question. And unfortunately, we don't have a great answer. I think uh, some of the models are basically black boxes. You can think of it as a big neural network that takes an image as an input and produces a scalar prediction as an output and we have no idea what kind of features the model is looking for. Uh, other models that we try to build are a little bit more interpretable in the sense that they first uh, do object detection and then they use the object counts to come up with estimates. And these models don't work as well as the, as the sort of end-to-end -end ones that they just use a deep neural network to do everything. Uh, but they are much more interpretable because at that point then you see that they are making prediction based on the kind of objects that they see. And so at that point, they are, it's, it's, you know, it, it's much more interpretable in the sense of what exactly they are doing. In terms of the inputs, we are using uh, satellite images or remote sensing data. So that's what's used though. And obviously there are things that you cannot see uh, from space. You cannot see inside people's houses, but you know, it, did the, these models are statistical? That they just probably see the size of the houses. You can see that the, the, there is a lot of visual cues that these models extract and then use to make the prediction. And they're not perfect and they make mistakes, but we do try to evaluate them out of sample and um, so on data they have not been trained on and they seem to perform reasonably well. So of course they're gonna make mistakes and we don't know exactly where those mistakes are distributed and, and they might be making there must be there might there might be bias in the kind of mistakes that the models make, uh, but uh, yeah, they, they're yeah. sort of reasonable yeah. things that yeah. we've evaluated. That. And and that is the point because when you talk about wealth index, you know, I mean, I grew up in Africa, so I'm talking about this. In some part of the world, people live close together, and in, in some cases, it doesn't mean that you know, in terms of wealth and stuff like that, they might actually be better if those houses are well built. In some other places they live together because maybe people are poor, you know, like, so it's very subjective. It's very subjective in terms of, you know, trying to find, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, you, you, know, I'm, you know what I mean? So it's good to, if this can be refined, you know, use better uh, models or better features to, you know, based on fact on the ground and this fact on the ground vary from countries to countries or from region to regions, you know, uh, th that'd be good. That'd be a good, uh, you know, if this can be improved upon that, that'd be good, you know, for a variety of reasons. Yeah. 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 So we did evaluate out of countries. Or like we, we tried to train on a subset of countries and then test it on a, on a different country the model was not trained on. And, and depending how similar those countries are, uh, the performance might be good or, or bad. So you, could, you know, if you try to go from East Africa to West Africa, maybe the model will not work. But if you try to predict asset wealth in a neighboring country, then it typically works okay. And so, of course, there are limitations in terms of how well it generalizes, but yeah, I think that's that's a fair point what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. There's like uh, Yun Zhang. Okay, thank you. Hi, Stefano. Uh, thanks for very much for the very exciting talk. So I have one technical question. You use so much satellite images and also so much, so much data from ground. So how do you access so much data on the fly or very quick? Do you copy all the data to your server or you have access to all the database and to, to simultaneously on the time, on the fly to access the data? Uh, good question, yeah. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a mix. 
Um, for training, uh, we typically have to uh, get the data on our servers and this, you have to do it locally just because otherwise it wouldn't be fast enough. Uh, so for the supervised learning training, usually that's not a lot of labeled training data, so it's not a big issue. For the unsupervised learning, yeah, we just collect as much data as we need. We put it on our servers, we do the training locally. Uh, then for inference, so let's say we want to make a prediction for, for the whole continent, then that's where you can actually use cloud resources to, to do that. And so once you've trained the model, in terms of deploying it, uh, you can use cloud. Uh, I mean, we've also done it locally on our servers, but uh, it's actually a little bit easier to, to, to just use cloud services if we, you know, off, luckily, uh, cloud providers like Google, Amazon, that they've been pretty kind to us in terms of like giving us uh, credits and, and compute resources. And so we've often been partnering with them to really uh, do, do, do the big inference jobs with uh, using, using, using cloud resources. Okay, thank you very much. I have, uh, I see some questions in chat if uh, I, I can, I'll be happy to relay them here. So uh, there's a question uh, on, uh, it, it's the question is, is the Google Maps static API a good source of temporal high-res images? It's a good one uh, in terms of its high quality. Uh, as far as I know, you there is no temporal access, so there's no way to uh, require, to, to ask for a particular timestamp. So you just get whatever is the latest they have access to. And there are also issues with the um, license. So as far as I know, that you're not allowed to use them to basically uh, come up with any derivative product, whatever that means. And so there are issues with using them even for academic uh, research. So yeah, use it at your own risk. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Saroba. Yes. Yeah, uh, I, I have a different type of question. In uh, 2010 in Haiti, uh, after the earthquake, about 10 months later, around October, uh, there were the first uh, cases of cholera. And by three years later, uh, there were about 685,000 cases of cholera and about 10,000 dead. Uh, one of the big problems is that uh, everybody would go after this in terms of bringing more beds, more physicians, more nurses, when in reality, what needed to be done was to correct the water infrastructure. Uh, so you needed civil engineers. And in order to know that, you need to have a good, perhaps, uh, geo map that, that uh, showcases the places where this disruption uh is happening and but but also in addition uh the data had to be in the cloud because they you know they did not have electricity uh so the communications when you were in haiti had to be via satellite so it's a, it's a fairly complex thing but both to treat the people and to correct infrastructure you need to be able to use that geospatial data. And I wondered from that perspective of your project, how do you see uh, um, connecting the dots type of thing? Oh yeah, I think it, in fact, this kind of data was actually even used to uh, plan the more recently COVID vaccines in Africa, like the rollout. I mean, that requires a lot of knowledge about infrastructure and when refrigeration is possible and where people live and where to set up uh, distribution centers. And it was actually used by governments, the, the, this kind of socioeconomic data to figure out what is a reasonable rollout strategy. So for sure, there's all kinds of decisions related to public health. And I mentioned even that there is this NGO we work with that they, they are, they are um, uh, providing vitamin supplements. And yeah, one of the key questions they always have is uh, how to target, like where, where do we go? Where do we send this, this aid to? And uh, so there's all kinds of questions that can, be answered better once you have access to good data on the ground about the infrastructure, as you said, uh, where people live. Like there is this whole data fabric that you need to have access to if you want to make good decisions. And sometimes you even need to forecast, right? Because it's not just about the situation now, but if you're investing in uh, infrastructure, 
you, you're building highways or you're building a fiber, then you need to know, know what happens now. What is the situation going to be 10 years from now? And uh, that's even more interesting in terms of like a machine learning problem that you need to address. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, uh, any other questions? I see some more in chat. I, if you can take some more, Stefano. <laughs> um, so uh, there's a question. Uh, what are the applications of this type of work in AI in regards to sustainability? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I mentioned a few. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, answer part of that. Right, and I think there, I believe you answered the other earlier, there's a, an earlier question on um, asset wealth, which I believe you answered in the context of a previous question. Um, all right, any other questions from the audience? All right. Can I ask one question? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, so one of the big, challenges that you spoke about was uh, having this lack of training data sets when we're trying to measure, you know, economic development or poverty or even something today as, you know, war crimes in Ukraine. And so there was a very interesting paper and study that they did in India, which was in the Sundarbans, which um, from a satellite image, it, you know, it looks great because it's green and it has water and has all these perfect environmental variables. But in reality, it's a very poor economic zone. And so what they tried to do is uh, take satellite data and they looked at relative poverty in relation with um, you know, environmental variables. Do you think looking at the sort of economic developments with relationship with the environmental variables will actually um, sort of make do for this lack of training data sets that we have right now? Yeah, I think I, I would think of them as additional features that we can use to to improve the predictions. I mean, I totally agree that uh, there's just ambiguity. If you just look at a satellite image from space, there are, there are things you can't see, and uh, you know there's just some fundamental limits in how well you can do. And to improve there, we need to add additional features, whether it's uh, uh, environmental features or street view images or phone data. Uh, I think there's a lot of possibilities in terms of uh, improving the accuracy by bringing in um, additional sources of data. I think the, the key thing would be we need to make sure that these sources are cheap to, to, to access and ideally they are available everywhere uh, so that the models are really scalable. Um, but as long as they are, and I think there are many such, um, such data that we can use, then I think that's definitely a possibility. So just a quick follow-up to that. Um... So right now, uh, in most of these models, we're looking at a combination of satellite data along with other um, traditional sources of data, which is surveys and, uh, you know, just measuring other poverty indexes. I mean, I'm just talking about poverty right now, but um, what do you think going ahead will be the ratio of how much satellite data we use versus to how much traditional sources and do you think uh, deep learning models can actually overcome that and where we use minimal traditional sources because bias is most there? And yeah, um, I don't think we'll ever replace entirely the need for you know actual surveys collected on the ground. I think it's, uh, I don't think we'll, it, it'll be completely replaced by yes, machine learning models. I think I see them as complementary. They, they can fill in the gaps, they can uh, maybe do forecasting, they can, um, they can even guide the, the data collection processes. I didn't talk about it, but we've been exploring this idea, which I think you were hinting to, that you know, maybe you can use a machine learning model to uh, come up with a rough estimate, and then you can use that to uh, guide the data collection on the ground, and you can send, uh, you, you can make the data collection effort much more efficient because you just have to survey locations where the machine learning model is, is, has the highest uncertainty, essentially. And these are things that we've not actually implemented on the ground. So I don't know if it would actually work in practice, but at least in simulation, it seems like there are big opportunities for, uh, for exploring these kind of ideas where it's going to be kind of like a combination of machine learning and, and traditional data collection efforts on the ground. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a, one question. 
I accept them. Um, I really like the talk. So you you clearly have a very strong application on satellite images on uh, different sustainability of the uh, forecasting. I wonder, like the geospatial data is actually uh, the one difficulty is a multi modality nature. Um, do you have any suggestion like how to use this multi modality data uh, in the pre training framework? Uh, with inspired by the foundation model idea. Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that's, uh, uh, I mean, I, I hinted a little bit about the, the Wikipedia project where we try to use text uh, and images, but yeah, there's a lot of other metadata that, that, uh, that, that you know, is also indexed. There's also spatial temporal, and then, you know, you can start thinking about how to combine uh, images with metadata with text uh, and uh, yeah I think that the multimodality nature is going to be interesting because there's multiple complementary views and uh, it's also interesting from a technical perspective because that's probably going to require new architectures and new ideas from a machine learning perspective so it's an interesting problem to, to work with. Thanks. I have a question, if I may. <laughs> uh, so the, the um, you had some very interesting work with mask autoencoders and I believe vision transformers. And I was curious if you, uh, so did I understand you correctly? Maybe I misunderstood, but are you using that to augment as a data augmentation strategy uh, uh, to create more additional data? Um, it, it, it's more like a self-supervised pre-training. So yeah. it, it's basically, it, it, it's very similar to like these mass language models where you basically take huge amounts of text from the internet and you train a model to, you take a, you take a sentence, you mask out some words and then you train a model to guess what those words were. And in order to do that, you need to somehow understand the meaning of the sentence. And, right. uh, and it's the same thing for images. You take an image, you mask out some patches and then you ask the model to reconstruct them. And to do well at the task, you kind of like have to understand the meaning of the image. And right. That's what we do. We basically pre-train on a lot of unlabeled data with this sub-supervised learning objective. And then we use that network to, and we fine tune it on other tasks and it ends up being performing. performing. So that was very interesting because I was wondering if, if, um, because at the end of the day, you're, you're, whatever you mask out and then are predicting, uh, I, I wonder if you have any insights on any issues that arise from that, Like, because that may not be perfect as well. And then how does that affect, can, can that hurt instead of help under certain conditions? Uh, yeah, I think that, that we explore, especially like for, for uh, remote sensing data, there is, there is a lot of possibilities in the ways you can mask, like you can mask over space, over time, over yeah. bands. And uh, it wasn't clear to us what was their best strategy. And we explored uh, different variants. And uh, yeah, you can look at the papers to see the detail. I'll, I will, I will off, I'll do that offline and I might have some follow-up questions on that. But that was very interesting. Thank you. All right. I, I actually need to go. Uh, it's, yes. Uh, but yeah. Thank was, you all. Thank great. you, Stefano. Thanks all for right. having me. Yeah. Thanks for the questions. Bye-bye.